Welcome to Glycobiology Analysis Solutions using HPAE PAD. I'm Tamlin Oliver, Managing Editor of GEN, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Post-translational modification of proteins with oligosaccharides to form glycoproteins is a common biological motif. These glycoprotein oligosaccharides are involved in a wide range of biological and physiological processes, including recognition and regulatory functions, cellular communication, gene expression, cellular immunity, growth, and development. Cancer progress, invasion, and metastases have all been associated with aberrant like oscillation of proteins. There are many analytical approaches for carbohydrate analysis. This webinar will discuss how HPAE PAD analysis are performed to determine monosaccharides, sialic acids, oligosaccharides, and other carbohydrate components of glycoproteins. Our speaker, Jeff Rohr, Director of Applications Development at Thermo Fisher Scientific, will explain the importance of protein glycosylation and how, and discuss analysis challenges. He will introduce HPAE PAD and explain how it can be effectively used to investigate key post-translational modifications. Before Jeff gets started, though, I want to encourage you to submit questions for him to answer at the end of his discussion. He will answer as many questions as he can after the final presentation. Jeff, we're ready for you. Thank you, Tamlin. Um, as you can see, my title, Glycobiology Analysis Solutions Using HPA PAD, um, I want to first explain the acronym HPA PAD. That stands for High Peak Performance Anion Exchange Chromatography with Pulse Amperometric Detection. And I'm going to talk, be telling you a little about how that technique works and then how it's applied during today's webinar. So first, we'll go through our agenda. Um, Tamlin's already told you some of the, uh, the importance of glycosylation, and, and uh, I'll go through a little bit of that to start. Um, and then I'll talk about some of the challenges we face in determining carbohydrates. Um, then we will discuss high pH anion exchange, the separation portion of the HPA pad, and then go into the detection portion pulse amperometric detection. Finally, we'll take HPA pad and show applications to glycosylation analysis, first for monosaccharides, both neutral and amino sugars, and then charged monosaccharides, particularly mannose 6-phosphate and sialic acids. And then we'll conclude with some oligosaccharide examples, polysalic acids and asparagine or N-linked oligosaccharides. So this slide shows some of the importances of glycosylation, and you can see the first, the first um, bold point there about how it's important for biopharmaceuticals. Um, basically, glycosylated biopharmaceuticals have to be delivered to the patient with reproducible glycosylation, and you see that's because it's involved with the clinical efficacy, um, biological activity, in vivo half-life, and some of the other points you see there. Um, and the FDA's points to consider um, glycosylation analysis, uh, namely monosaccharide analysis and oligosaccharide analysis, are suggested, um, suggested analyses. So it's really part of a well-characterized biological product. Now, also, protein glycoforms can change depending on the, what you see listed there, both you know, age, sex, pregnancy, disease. Now, a glycoform is if you take the protein Say it has one attachment site for carbohydrate, that attachment site can be filled with many different oligosaccharides. Each single oligosaccharide represents a glycoform, and then many proteins have many attachment sites, so they could have different oligosaccharides at each, each attachment site. But those glycoforms are important, as, as you see, in, in that they vary with the states below, and this is one of the things that people do for glycomics, and it's really important important for when determining oligosaccharide profiling, which we'll talk about when we get to, toward the end of the seminar. Now, this just a, shows a cartoon of an IgG, obviously a very important molecule for biopharmaceuticals, and this shows all the different possible post-translational modifications, well, not all the different, but many of the common post-translational modifications. Um, what I put this up here to show you that Carbohydrates or oligosaccharides to make a glycoprotein is a post-translational modification. So we see linked at the top there the asparagine. That's um, 
where we get our N-linked or our asparagine-linked um, glycosylation, but we also can have serine or threonine, we can get O-linked glycosylation, so that means linked through an oxygen rather than a nitrogen like the N-linked. Now, um, when we determine carbohydrates from glycoproteins, generally the first step is we want to release the oligosaccharide or the carbohydrate from the glycoprotein. Um, if we're going to bust it up or make it into smaller pieces, we generally do that through acid hydrolysis. And here we list a couple different treatments. Now, there's other treatments too, but these are some common ones. Um, using hydrochloric acid, this will um, get us down to amino sugar analysis so we can determine the amount of n glucosamine or n Um Trifluoroacetic acid is a good hydrolysis agent for determining all the different neutral monosaccharides, including mannose, galactose, um, and acetylglucosamine also. And then acetic acid, we use a weaker acid to release our more acid labile sialic acids. Now, we also use enzymes um, for sialic acid analysis. We'll use the neuraminidase. Um, to release those N-linked or asparagine-linked oligosaccharides, we'll use the amidase P and GASF. Um, there's also one that's um, isolated from almond, um, PNGSA, that's less often used but often very good for small glycopeptides. And then the last point there really shouldn't be under enzymatic release, but if we're going to determine O-linked or those serine um, threonine-linked oligosaccharides, we do a chemical treatment called reductive beta elimination. I'm not going to discuss that today, but that's also a, a technique that's been um, married to HPA pad for oligosaccharide profiling. Now, what are our challenges in carbohydrate analysis? Well, first, carbohydrates, most of them do not have a chromophore. So if we want to do any kind of sensitive analysis or detection, um, it's just not going to be possible because we don't get good absorbance from them. And that, what that means is we really need alternative detection techniques. And as we'll find out, PAT is one of those detection techniques that can be used. Um, also, they're very polar, so they don't apply to common liquid chromatography like a reverse phase, which look at more hydrophobic molecules. They're also very similar in structure, so we're going to need high-resolution separations in order to get resolution between our different monosaccharides or oligosaccharides. Um, and this talks about that, where we're, individual monosaccharide separations can be challenging. Also, oligosaccharides can differ only by their linkages, so they can have the same mass, the same composition, but for instance, a, a sialic acid could be linked either alpha-2,3 or alpha-2,6, and there are different structures, but yet they have the same mass, and again, they're going to be something that's going to be a challenge to separate. And as I've already alluded to, HPA pad overcomes these challenges, and we'll, and we'll see how in the rest of the webinar. So some of the basics of the way HPA works, so our high-performance anion exchange chromatography. Basically, this, the carbohydrates are separated as oxyanions. So we don't really think about carbohydrates as anions, but they can be anions when the pH is high, meaning greater than 12. And this means if we're going to be greater than 12, we're going to need um, eluents or mobile phases that um, use, have hydroxide in them. Um, this is a challenging, obviously these are challenging mobile phases for most chromatography equipment. Now, if the carbohydrate is in fact charged, like a sialic acid, and you'll, we'll see that in a bit, um, we will need a, a stronger pushing agent or a mobile phase, and usually we're using acetate for that, so sodium acetate um, to do that elution. So these are some common monosaccharide structures, and they, they illustrate a couple different points. If we look at the top row there, we've got our basic glucose, and then we have galactose. Um, galactose is, just differs in the four position um, hydroxide. So it's the same, the same mass, the same composition, but the hydroxide in the four position is above the plane uh, instead of below the plane in glucose. In mannose, it's the two position where the hydroxide is above the plane instead of below the plane. So there are our common neutral sugar neutral sugar monosaccharides. Um, below glucosamine and galactosamine, we see the N-acetylglucosamine and the N-acetylgalactosamine. In that case, at the two position, 
we've anacetylated, we replaced the hydroxyl with an anacetylated amine. Um, and again, they're very similar in structure, but they, those are the amino sugars. And then finally, at our bottom right side there, we see our n acetyl nearminic acid, or commonly referred to as salic acid, and that one has our carboxyl group. So that one is actually charged at neutral pH, while the rest are all neutral, and as we can see, they really don't have a chromophore. So th these structures, we're going to need the high resolution to separate things like glucose, galactose, and mannose. And how do we go about doing that? Well, first of all, let's look at their acidities. So these are some constants for common carbohydrates. And if we look at, say, glucose, it's got a pK of 12.28. Now, that says it's a very poor acid. Um, but what it does tell us is that we get the pH somewhere over 12, we're going to start making oxyanions, and therefore we can do anion exchange. And if we take a look at a few others, galactose is, is a little is even a worse um, even a worse um, acid, so that's 12.39. Whereas mannose is a better acid at 12.08. Now, if we look at the bottom two in that table, sorbitol, which is the reduced form of glucose. Um, has a much higher pKa, and what that shows us um, is that if we remove what we call the, the anomeric hydroxyls, and you'll see that the one position where I have that uh, on the far right, if we look at mannose, where we have the hydroxyl, it just has the wavy line. That can be either above the plane or below the plane, and that contributes a good amount of the acidity or the acidic properties to the monosaccharide. So if we go back and we see that sorbitol has lost that anomeric hydroxyl now, it now is, it, it's now a fixed position, it's 13.6. If we take the glucoside, so we methylate it, we also see that also um, removes it. So it shows that that anomeric hydroxyl is important to the, to the retention on the column. So let's look at what kind of column we need to, to um, separate these monosaccharides and other carbohydrates. And this shows the construction of a carbopack column and this cartoon. Uh, this is a solid polymeric bead, on, and that bead is resistant to pH. So it's 0 to 14 pH compatible. So that allows us to use those hydroxide elements we're going to need to ionize the monosaccharides. Then we surface sulfonate that in hot sulfuric acid to create anionic groups on the, on the surface of that bead. Again, that's, that's a solid bead. We then add these small latex beads, so the very small beads that have quaternary amine groups. That's going to be our anion exchanger. And what that does is gives us a very short diffusion path length so we can get high-resolution separation. So we don't, it's not, we're not having sugars or molecules going in and out of pores are getting right on and off the ion exchange group. So let's look at a result of that. This is our carbopack PA20, the column we commonly use for monosaccharide analysis. You'll notice that our, our eluent here is 10 millimolar sodium hydroxide, so we're using a hydroxide eluent. We're separating these six common monosaccharides from, from mammalian glycoproteins. Um, and we look at that three I pointed out before, galactose peak 4, glucose peak 5, and mannose peak 6. They're all well resolved. Remember that galactose was the worst acid, so it's the least retained. So it's a, it had a pK of 12.39. That glucose was 12.28, and the mannose 12.08. And you can see the, the best acid elutes, elutes the latest. And if we look at our amino sugars that have lost the hydroxyl group, they elute earlier, and they elute in the same order, galactosamine, glucosamine, galactose, glucose. We also have fucose, which is a deoxy sugar. It's lost the hydroxyl, and that elutes earlier. So we can actually rationalize a separation based on the, the pKa's, the acidities, and the number of hydroxyls. Now, that was only using hydroxide. If we look at a charged um, monosaccharide like sialic acid, and this shows two common sialic acids, and acetyl nerminic acid and glycolyl nerminic acid. And in this case, we're using acetate, and I've put that in blue here in the L1 to resolve these with the same carbopack PA20 column. Now, we'll look at sialic acid separations in more detail later in this seminar. 
So what about the detection part? So the basics of PAD, carbohydrates are detecting at a, detected at a gold working electrode at high pH by PAD. Now, that um, is great because we're working at high pH. We have a mobile phase that's hydroxide. Um, and here we apply a series of potentials on that working electrode where one of those potentials we're detecting at. And the rest are used for cleaning the electrode prior to the next injection. Now, that frequency of that waveform is 2 hertz, so it's done two times a second. So it's, it's, a great, um, it's a great frequency for using for liquid chromatography. So the next slide just shows um, the waveform. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but this portion here in blue is where we're actually detecting. We're applying the potential on that electrode that's oxidizing carbohydrates. That oxidation causes current. And that current we're integrating to get charged. So all, in all the cases on our y-axis of our chromatograms, we're going to display charge, some, or like nanocoulombs. Then we do a couple quick potentials to clean, and then we go back to the start. We let, let charging current decay, which means we're not going to detect things that aren't carbohydrate. And we do that just every half, half, half a second we're doing that. And this is just our potential. So this is what we, for potential waveform, we can use it for all different types of carbohydrates, monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, salic acids. No need to change the waveform. So our system we're using for this analysis is an ICS 5000 plus system. It's a polymeric system, so we can use the sodium hydroxide mobile phases and not have problems. I, um, you can read through the list here. I want to point out two things in particular. Um, for monosaccharide analysis, we can use an eluent generator. The monosaccharide applications I'm going to show you with the neutral sugars and, uh, and the amino sugars will be using that eluent generator. Um, and, we can, um, and that's a very a, a good, a good, a good thing for automation and for eliminating um, labor. I also want to point out that the, our working electrode is a disposable electrode. It's, uh, it's gold on PTFE that can, be, um, that can be used up for at least a month, and it um, doesn't require any polishing of the electrode surface. So, again, that's a labor saver and also provides greater reproducibility. So let's look at some um, application examples. We'll start with um, neutral and amino sugars in our monosaccharide analysis. So we determine monosaccharides for a number of reasons. Uh, one is we can tell, we can quantify how much fucose is there, how much salic acid, um, galactose, or, or, or mannose, and these are all important for for different um, reasons. Um, if the amount of salic acid has a lot to do with if your protein you're making is going to survive the bloodstream and not get cleared by the liver. Um, the amount of galactose is important when we're doing IgGs, as is the amount of mannose and fucose. It just also tells us a lot of, about what type of oligosaccharides we can find on that glycoprotein. Um, we can, if we have a lot of glucosamine, N-acetylglucosamine, and no N-acetylgalactosamine, we know we have all N-linked. If we have a combination of both, we, we have a good possibility we have some O-linked oligosaccharides there. It also allows us to determine how much sugar is there per mole of protein. So we can find out um, moles per mole. We can also find the percent glycosylation. So IgGs, for example, have very low percent glycosylation. They tend to be, tend to be in the 1% to 3% region, whereas some proteins can be over 50% glycosylated. And monosaccharide analysis allows us to give a good determination of that. So let's look at um, how we go about doing that. Now, first, we have to do that acid hydrolysis. Um, in one case, we use TFA. We can do that to release the monosaccharides and, um, um, from, our, from our attached oligosaccharides. And then um, once, we, once we've done that acid hydrolysis under the conditions that's shown up there, we then have to remove that acid. We generally do that by drying, in, in vacuum drying, using um, something like a speed vac, and then we then just inject, we reconstitute the sample in DI water and inject it onto a carbopack column, 
Note that we don't have to re-anacetylate the amino sugars as many other methods require. If you remember that um, PA20 separation I showed you, showed you glucosamine and galactosamine, not the anacetylated versions. So we don't have to do a re-anacetylation. We can just analyze them as, as is. And then we just quantify our monosaccharides versus a calibration curve we've created with external standards. Now this, this uh, shows you a separation of monosaccharides from human IgG, just a, a protein you can purchase from many different chemical companies. And the top portion in chromatogram A shows the um, HCL hydrolysis we're looking for amino sugars. Now for human IgG, we generally don't see a lot of O-glycosylation and we only see glucosamine here, so it suggests we just have N-glycosylation. Um, chromatogram B is the TFA hydrolysis. Now that shows our, our neutral sugars, um, so that, and we also get amino sugars, although not quite full recovery of those, but you can see we can see fucose, glucosamine, galactose, and mannose. Now in this case, what, I've, what we've done um, I've injected a lot more protein than we, when we generally need. This is, shows 10 micrograms injected, and that's injected to show that um, the amino trap column, which I haven't pointed out, as we're using as a guard column in front of the Carbapac PA20, that's used to remove or push any kind of inf interfering peptides or amino acids that could interfere with our quantitation or monosaccharides. We push them out to the to the, the wash section of the chromatogram. So if you look at the far right of both those chromatograms, you see a lot of large peaks, and that's during when we're washing the column. So that makes it a nice, clean chromatogram. And we've injected a lot more just to show how much stuff really elutes out in that area. So on the next slide, this is a blow-up of just the chromatography region, but in this case, we're only injecting two micrograms of that IgG. And remember, this IgG, is, as I told you before, is a very lightly glycosylated glycoprotein. So that means this requires more than most proteins. Some proteins, we're only going to have to inject a couple of tenths of micrograms to get a monosaccharide analysis. And here again, in A above is the, is the HCL hydrolysis, and, and we see we don't, we don't get very good recovery of the neutral sugars like um, galactose and mannose, but we don't expect to for that analysis. But the, the separation below with the TFA shows, again, good size peaks that are easily quantifiable. Um, and we're doing fucose. We see our glucosamine. We see our galactose. And, and we also see our mannose. We also have a little bit of glucose. That's just due to the fact that glucose, glucose excuse me, is rather ubiquitous. And we're going to get that um, just about any time we do a hydrolysis. So let's look at our next application here. That's the um, determination of mannose 6-phosphate. Again, now mannose 6-phosphate will be a negatively charged sugar at um, neutral pH, so we can already anticipate that we're going to have to use acetate in our mobile phase to do determinations of mannose 6-phosphate. Now, as, it, as your fr first point here tells you, mannose 6-phosphate is found in glycoproteins and receptors um, involved in, in, in in basically studies of treating um, genetic lysosomal um, storage disorders. And in fact, there are already a couple products on, in the market for enzyme replacement therapies you, that, have, that have mannose 6-phosphate on them that basically correct some of these properties, um, some, of the, some of these diseases using proteins um, for replacement. And again, they have mannose 6-phosphate. So you're going to have to, it's really important that we're going to that the amount of mannose 6-phosphate on those therapeutic proteins is correct or um, in all likelihood the protein's not, the protein's not going to be effective in treating, treating the disorder. So unfortunately for um, us here at Thermo Fisher, there are no um, commercially available glycoproteins that contain mannose 6-phosphate. So in the lab here, what we did was simulate a, a protein with mannose 6-phosphate. And in this case, we're, we're using our Carbopac PA200 column, the column we often use for oligosaccharide analysis. And we've used 
hydrolysis conditions under the sample prep there that is taken from a paper from a company that does produce a therapeutic glycoprotein that contains mannose 6-phosphate. So these are what I would call typical hydrolysis conditions. And to mimic um, the analysis here, we've taken bovine serum albumin, a non-glycosylated protein, and hydrolyzed it under those conditions. So that's chromatogram A um, in the bottom. We can see we have a lot of peaks eluding early here. And then what we've done is spiked in two different amounts of mannose 6-phosphate in, in nominally 204 and 400 picomoles of mannose 6-phosphate. And you can see B is the 200, which we've quantified with an external standard at 193, so we're getting good recovery of that. And C is 404 again, so we're getting good recovery of our 400. And we see we're eluding that peak in an area that, uh, in, for this protein, doesn't have any interfering peaks. Obviously, any protein we would do, we have to develop this separation to make sure that's true. But we're getting good recovery, so it shows we're not overloading the column. Um, the other thing is, note, as we discussed earlier, this has acetate in the mobile phase in addition to the hydroxide so that we can um, separate this in a reasonable amount of time. And we've taken this out a little longer just to loot anything else off. It's possible this could be a shorter separation if we worked on it some more. Now, the other charged monosaccharide, are, are, and one that is quite important and, and just about most, most glycoproteins for therapeutics um, t seem to have sialic acid, so they need to be, needs to be determined. Um, and this slide tells you some of the importance. Um, basically, it's very important for the um, bioavailability uh, if, if, and the stability. If we don't have the sialic acid on the protein and we're putting it intravenously, it's going to be clear by the liver and it's not going to get to its site of function. Um, the second bullet there talks about the fact that there are 50, um, over 50 natural sialic acids, but generally only two are determined. And we'll see a little bit why that is. But N-acetylnuraminic acid, uh, which is I've got label acronym here of NU5ac, or the N-glycolylnuraminic acid. And there is growing evidence, and this is um, somewhat controversial, that, um, that the glycolated version is immunogenic. Basically, healthy humans do not produce the glycoproteins with the uh, N-glycolated version, so it can could theoretically cause an immune reaction in humans. Most glycoproteins that are for therapeutics are produced in Chinese hamster ovary cells. They do, will, will add some N-glycolated version. So the level of that silic acid could be important and generally it is monitored in those proteins. So let's look at um, a cartoon of, of the silic acid structures and this shows a number of different ones that are possible. But in the blue here at the at the phi position, I've shown our our N acetyl and our N glycolyl. So those are common ones. Most of these others are linked through ester linkages. Now ester linkages are not very stable linkages. They're not stable at all in base. So by HPA pad, with typical conditions, we're not going to be able to determine any other any other um, salic acids besides the two N acetyl or N glycolyl. If we were going to do those other ones, we would choose a label, a method where we're labeling with a fluorescent label and separating by reverse phase um, chromatography. Um, but most people, companies just determine these two, and that's what the assay, that's what assays w we see a lot in the literature. So. Um, how, how do we go about doing that, um, analyzing sialic acids from glycoproteins? Um, first, um, it's, uh, we've already seen a separation of the two major sialic acids, and really they're, they're easy to resolve in pretty much any anion exchange column with either an isocratic or a gradient elution. Um, now, the N glycolyl, as we've already seen, elutes later in most samples, so, and because it's at a lower concentration, Isocratic separations are probably not going to be appropriate because that peak is going to broaden the longer it's on its column, and we're going to determine a small amount of that, hopefully, in the, in the presence of a larger amount of N-glycolyl. So it generally begs for a gradient separation. 
the the way we release those sialic acids from glycoproteins is with a mild acid hydrolysis. So in this case, I've pointed out one example, 0.1 normal HCl for one hour at 80 degrees. You'll note that the time and the temperature are a lot less than what we did for the other monosaccharides, as well as the acid concentration. We could also use the enzyme neuraminidase to release the sialic acids. And then, after again, we, we can remove that acid by drying, reconstituting water, and then inject. With the neuraminidase digestions, we can directly inject um, the sample unless we're trying to inject too much. We, we don't want to overload the column with the, the buffer that the, that the neuraminidase digest is done in. But for typical conditions, we can inject you know, 10, 20 microliters that digest directly onto the carbopack column. And then, again, because the phthalic acids are charged at neutral pH, we're going to use acetate um, in the eluent. We also are calibrating versus a, a an external calibration curve. I mean, we're quantifying, excuse me, versus an external calibration curve. And um, I reviewed basically phthalic acid analysis methods, HPA PAT, a number of years ago, and that is a good source for determining methods for hydrolysis and some of the separation techniques. Um, but we have updated that. Um, we have updated the separation since that time. This shows you with that same separation I showed you of standards earlier in the presentation, um, the determination of sialic acid, the two major sialic acids in five different standard glycoproteins. So we see we have um, bovine, apotransferrin, human transferrin, um, fetuin, um, that's from calves or cows, um, sheep acid one glycoprotein, and human al alpha acid one. Now, if we notice, well, first let's look at the fact that our human proteins don't have the n over in it. So if we look at the trace B, which is the yellow trace, and um, trace E, which is the magenta trace there, neither of those have peak 2, whereas our, our, our glycoproteins from other mammals do have the N-glycolyl. So that demonstrates that. We also see that we only have small number of picomoles injected, so it just shows the sensitivity of the technique here. Um, this, these are all done after acid hydrolysis, and we're doing this on the Carbapac PA20 column. Now, this separation injection ejection is about 16 and a half minutes. And when we updated this a few years ago and took it out and showed it to a number of customers and, and researchers, what they said is they would actually like a faster method than that. So that's what we set about to do is to develop a faster method. Um, my colleague, Deanna Hurum, um, developed this method on a, a short um, carbo, carbo pack column, which we've um, designated the carbo pack PA20 fast salic acid analysis column. And this is a four and a half minute separation injection injection. And we see here our N glycolyl and N acetyl standards. So our N acetyl and peak one N glycolyl um, separated. We're just showing um, low peak of moles amount injected, only 11 for the N glycolyl and one tenth of that. I mean, 11 for the N acetyl and one tenth of that for the N glycolyl. Um, but again, that's, right now, this is just a standard. Um, does it, can we make this work for glycoproteins? And the answer is yes. Here, we're looking at three of those standard glycoproteins I showed you for the longer separation. And we're, here we have the human alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, calf fetuin, and the um, sheep alpha, alpha acid 1 glycoprotein. Again, the human is lacking the N glycolyl. The, the other two have the N glycolyl. And we get the N acetyl eluded away from everything else at the beginning of the separation. That's one of the things we are trying to optimize to make sure that would work well. Um, this um, has been well received. We published this in late um, 2011 in analytical biochemistry, so there's more details there for those that would like to see that. So let's now turn to oligosaccharides. Uh, we'll start with uh, polysialic acid analysis. Um, polysialic acids are, are long linear polymers of sialic acid, um, and they're also a post-translational modification. Um, they go to certain sets of proteins often found in um, 
the brain in the brain they can be found in throughout nature as the second point um, um, the second bullet points out they're also displayed in a variety of cancers um, the the amount um, the attachment can change and this is a, a fairly active area of research and um, but the tools aren't always the best in, in determining these because they're difficult molecules and they do are believed to uh, modulate um, cell-cell interaction so during brain development um, also during tumor development again this is an active area of research um, one of the things that people are interested in finding out is the degree of polymerization so how many of those phthalic acids are linked together in different states and um, and that hopefully will shed light on on basically regulations and those cell to cell cell interactions so let's look at what we've um, developed for those separations um, first I want to point out that the pump that we're using is capable of not only delivering a linear gradient which is what we would call curve five um, but we all can also um, deliver convex and concave curves. Now these curves can be very successful in getting better spacing of separations and better separations of linear polymers of, of large degrees of polymerization like we're going to be looking at for the stylic acids. So I'm not going to go through the development but for for the stylic at, polystylic acids we found is that curve four, the one just above curve five there, was good for doing these separations. So let's look at an example separation here. Um, this doesn't say on it, but it's cholaminic acid, which is a polysalic acid you can purchase from a, a lot of different chemical companies. The, and what we're looking at is the numbers of degree of polymerization. So each peak representing another addition of a salic acid. Um, the top portion in magenta is a blow up of the latter portion of the separation and we're showing that we're getting at least close to a hundred um, degree of polymerization here this is um, with our Carbopac PA200 there have been plenty of publications using our older versions of columns that don't go quite this high in degree of polymerization so this is what we set out to show that with the the better newer column we could um, get higher degrees of polymerization now this points out that we're using acetate again these are charged so we need an acetate gradient but one of the things that was published was using nitrate as an eluent and so this shows that we can actually with nitrate as our as our pusher or as our stronger eluent we can get even a greater degree of polymerization the bottom chromatogram shows that we're going out you know maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 120 it's easily um, quantifiable in degree of polymerization now in this case we found that using curve 4 wasn't any more effective than the straight linear gradient of curve 5 um, but again this is shows the power of um, another eluent um, for this separation and getting higher degrees of polymerization so we think this is a good research tool for those working in the area of polysilic acid analysis so finally we're going to finish with some um, discussion of um, separation of asparagine linked or n-linked oligosaccharides now um, I, I talked a little bit at the beginning of the presentation about glycoforms and and that's a, that's really why oligosaccharide analysis is important because each of those multiple glycosylation sites or even if a single glycosylation site can have a different oligosaccharide that can be populated with many different oligosaccharides at that site and each of those represents one glycoforms and it's it's a major cause of protein heterogeneity and doing the oligosaccharide analysis allows us to give it a feel for what what we have in that glycoprotein the glycoforms can vary during production when we're producing the glycoprotein um, by for a biopharmaceutical product and really the key is what uh, what generally what I've heard is the FDA would like to see consistency in that whatever you had in the clinic that you're going to have when you go out and 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 give it to people later on so it's really looking for consistency oligos oligosaccharide profiling is a way of one way of many of determining that consistency um, it also allows us um, to look at um, key modifications as it shows here where 
we can see if we have fucose or high mannose or our charged thiolated oligosaccharides. So as I mentioned um, earlier in the in the webinar, is that the Carbopac PA200 is is our our best column for doing oligosaccharide analysis. This shows the separation of, of bovine fetuin, a very common glycoprotein, 20, 25% glycosylate. It's got plenty of sugar, got lots of sialic acid. As the title says, it's highly sialated. So in this case, our major peaks are tri-sialated. It means they have three sialic acids. These two major peaks only differ by the linkage of the sialic acid. So that's the linkage isomer I was talking about earlier. One is alpha-2-6, the first one. The second one has an alpha 2 three at the same spot, and we're separating with this with an acetate gradient, um, very good high-resolution separation. So uh, there's many um, glycoproteins separated in a similar manner using the HPA pad. Now, right today, we see a lot of, of work on, on monoclonal antibodies that are IgGs. Um, these are some of the common structures, many of them neutral, meaning they don't have sialic acid, that are found on IgGs. Um, commonly um, are, are G0F, which is no galactose, one fucose, that's the F, um, G1F with one galactose. We can also have none of those with the core fucose, which is like the G, which is the G0. And then we can have our high mannose. Um, some of these are unwanted in, in um, IgG monoclonal antibodies, so we have three mannoses, five, six, so the man three, five, and six. These are some of our charged ones that have two or one sialic acid. Let's look at some separations we've developed. Um, I'm going to apologize ahead of time because this G0 is actually what is G0F in the last, and this shows G0 minus F, so that would be the, what was G0 in the last slide. I had forgotten these were labeled differently. What we did is on the Carbopac PA200, we've developed a separation of some of these standards. We can see our MAN5 and MAN6 in there. And our G1 can have two isomers, and they're resolved here. So this is our standard mix. Our charged ones elude out here, our single sialic acid, our two sialic acids. And this is just human serum IgG, um, release, the oligosaccharides released with PNGASF. And here is a, a monoclonal antibody. It was a, a gift um, from a particular company. And it shows it's a lot simpler. But we see we have a lot of what we what in the last slide is the, the, the G1F, excuse me, the G0F. Now, this is um, more detail on this is in a, an issue of Genetic Engineering News back in 2010. So I, I mentioned these are isomers of the G1, G1F. It just says G1 there, there but it, by the nomenclature in the last slide, G1F, so it's got that single fucose in the core. And just to prove that that's exactly what that is, we have the, the standard with no fucose, and then we have our, um, our G1 before digestion, and then it, it's after digestion meets that. So we, this shows that there is, they both, in fact, have galactose in the end. So it's a pretty good demonstration we are getting resolution of those isomers. Now, we've been working a lot more in this area recently, and, and we'll see some, we'll see, uh, I, I think you'll see some publications from us where, where we're even doing um, what I think are probably better separations than this, but we're still in progress of doing that right now. So, uh, you know, I talked about a lot of a couple different assays today, um, the, the monosaccharides, the, the silic acids, mannose-6-phosphate, polysilic acids, and linked oligosaccharides. But really, there's a lot of other carbohydrates that can be assayed by HPA-PAD. Um, this is a, a list that shows many of these, including sulfated sugars, um, sugar acids, sugar alcohols. Um, sugar alcohols are often used to stabilize um, protein solutions for freezing, and you want to know that it's pure, so purity assays for mannitol are not uncommon. Um, even things like aminoglycosides, the neomyosin, and gentamyosin can be determined in this manner. So I want to wrap up with a few conclusions today. Um, I think, as I pointed out in the last slide, HPA pad really can be used for a variety of carbohydrates, uh, monosaccharides all the way to complex oligosaccharides like polysilic acids. And it's, a, and it's the same instrument, um, maybe varying the columns somewhat, but some of the columns can be used for the same, many of the same assays. 
Um, the importantly, the analysis is direct. There's no modification required of the um, release to oligosaccharides. That saves time. It uh, offers more confidence in the results. Um, anytime you're doing something direct, it eliminates a step and eliminates a possibility for error. And again, these resolution, high resolution separations do not require labeling to do that. So we don't require labeling either for separation or detection. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you for your time today and, and go back to Tamlin. Thanks for a great presentation, Jeff. Uh, we already have a bunch of questions from the audience, so have a drink of water, and we can okay. get started with the Q&A. All Thank right, you. so the, the first question is, um, can HPAE pad be interfaced with MS? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's something I didn't cover today. Um, it, HPA pad, it can be, um, um, the, the simple answer is yes. Um, in detail, what we would do is we take a, a device we have for my chromatography called a suppressor, and that basically converts the mobile phase that really isn't mass spec compatible, but it converts it to dilute acetic acid, and that can be then um, interfaced to a mass spec, and we have a, a number of customers that have done that. Um, it's still something that it's not it's not routine and requires a little bit of expertise, but it certainly is done. Okay, Jeff, an audience member asks, um, I'm analyzing N-linked oligosaccharides. Which is the best carbopack column for that analysis? Uh, that's a number, another good question. Is, as we have a number, I think our, we've got um, seven or eight carbopack columns now, um, depending on how you count them. And... Um, We've got a number that are good for oligosaccharides. The PA200 is our, our best column um, for that analysis, but if, if you look at the literature, there are hundreds of good examples with the PA1 or PA100 column. But again, if I was starting today, I would start with the PA200. It gives the higher resolution separations. It also requires less acetate. So if you were going to interface with mass spec, it would be more amenable to doing that. Okay, and then what are the advantages to using eluent generation for monosaccharide analysis? Yeah, and I, I didn't have, have time to discuss that, so that's a, I'm glad somebody brought that up. Um, with the monosaccharide analysis with the eluent generator, it's making a, our potassium hydroxide for our mobile phase. Now, when you make hydroxide mobile phases manually, um, it's easy to get them contaminated with variable amounts of carbonate. Um, from the air, carbon dioxide um, is trapped by the, the, the basic solution. Carbonate's a stronger eluent, so it can change retention times. So by having it man prepared by the eluent generator, you get very reproducible separations because you don't have the carbonate there. And, and so if you were going to design a separation for monosaccharides in your lab and you had to transfer to another facility, or another researcher somewhere, it, it, it gives you much greater reproducibility and also saves a lot of labor and, and you don't have to play around with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide either. Okay, so another listener says, I've heard that HPAE pad should be performed on a polymeric system. Why is that? Well, it's, stainless steel systems really aren't designed for sodium hydroxide mobile phases. Uh, uh, people go out and 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 try to pacify them and use them that way, but eventually it's going to cause problems because you're going to get metals. The metals will contaminate your column. The column will then not give the separations you want. The metals will also can get to your electrode surface and change the electrode surface and reduce sensitivity. Uh, so it's, it's kind of like um, it's never been a good, like texting and driving, it's never been a good idea but people continue to do it. But the reason we design the systems is so people could use these eluents and get reproducible separations. All right, the next question is, uh, can I isolate oligosaccharides from an HPAE pad separation? Yes, um, the, well, the simple answer is yes, you certainly can. Um, and over the years, a number of people have done this. We sell um, preparative and semi-preparative carbopack columns for doing that. Um, in the case, people often buy the semi-preparative, which is a 9-millimeter column, 
And then remember, your eluent is hydroxide and sodium hydroxide. What generally, when we're doing preparation, people just put that in a, a dialysis um, tubing with like a thousand molecular weight cutoff and dialyze it to remove remove those um, remove the, the salts. Usually, it's, they first um, neutralize it with some acetic acid, so we're not sitting our carbohydrates. While most of them are fairly base stable, you don't want to have them sitting in base for um, hours and hours on end. So that's generally what people do. They, they've also hooked up the, our carbohydrate membrane to salt or to a four millimeter system, and use that to produce oligosaccharides and dilute acetic acid, and done multiple injections for collection for preparation. That was a good question. All right, here's another one. What is the detection sensitivity for PAD for carbohydrate analysis? Yeah, and it varies a lot, but generally it, it, it's generally low picomole sensitivity. So in that sialic acid analysis, I showed you very low picomole. In fact, if you looked at the uh, – I, I didn't point it out, but in, in the four-and-a-half-minute separation, we literally had less than a picomole injected. Now, that's a little deceiving because we are hydrolyzing more so we could dilute the the dilute it and and not have to not have to dry it first for that separation. But the sensitivity is I, I generally say low picomole. It can be under a picomole, as we've seen in that one case. Um, that's ju that's usually a lot more than than most people need, especially when you're doing biopharmaceuticals. You tend to you're making larger quantities, so it, it doesn't require a lot. But again, low picomole is probably a good a good answer to that question. All right, Jeff, that's all the time that we have for questions. I want to thank our audience for listening in, and thanks for submitting all the great questions. This webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. I want to thank our panelists. Jeff, thank you very much for your time today, as well as our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific. You should have just received a post-webinar survey. Uh, please take a minute and complete the survey. Your responses help us to create topical and timely webinars. Thank you.